Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, and thank you very much today for uh, joining us uh, for this discussion with Representative Adam Smith uh, from the 9th Congressional District of Washington State, uh, the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Um, this event and this whole series uh, is inspired by the vision of Atlantic Council Board Director, actually an executive committee member of our board, George Lund. Uh, who recognized the importance of providing a platform for congressional leaders to outline their strategies for their respective committees and for the country in what we all know is, 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 is a, a moment of historic challenge. Um, if you look just at the op-ed page of uh, the Wall Street Journal today, the big headline on a Secretary Ash Carter piece, the U.S. military needs budget certainty in uncertain times and you really have to underscore that uncertain times, you can deal with uncertainties when the world seems to be more certain, but now I think the, the combination of both the global uncertainty and other uncertainties makes, makes this even more difficult to navigate. Uh, I want to recognize George's crucial support of this initiative and also of the George Lund uh, Fellow at the uh, Brent Scowcroft Center for International Security. Uh, on June 23rd, we hosted the first a uh, such event, Congressman, with uh, you, uh, your colleague, House Armed Services Committee Chairman Mac Thornberry, who uh, outlined a strategy for deterring the Russian threat. On November 3rd, we'll continue with Senator Joe Donnelly from the Senate Armed Services Committee, who'll discuss his, his plan to prevent uh, military veteran suicide. Uh, today, we are delighted to have Ranking Member Smith here to present his vision for America's strategic defense priorities. Oh, and by the way, we did put out an Afghan piece that had the co-chairs of the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, McCain and Reed, actually the Ranking and, 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 um, and Chair uh, uh, McCain and Reed. Today's discussion grows out of the Council's expanding work on strategy, U.S. defense policy, and Congress's role uh, in American foreign policy leadership. This um, spring, we launched a comprehensive strategy initiative led by our Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security using a multi-vector approach to develop a strategic framework to guide American foreign policy. This initiative works across the Council from our strategic um, uh, foresight initiative to our Middle East Strategy Task Force, co-chaired by Steve Hadley and Madeleine Albright, another bipartisan effort, to our Lund em Emerging Defense Challenges Initiative, uh, and includes a strategy paper series, as, long, as well as an annual global strategy forum, which we launched this April. What underscores all of that is our feel, feeling at the Atlantic Council at this incredibly uh, important and defining moment in history, perhaps as important as the end of World War I, end of World War II, end of the Cold War, uh, that, uh, that, we d that we're all tactics and not enough strategy. Uh, and that we have to come together with, a, uh, with a, an idea of America's role in the world and then how we resource that and how we execute that. Uh, and at, at the heart of this initiative is our America in the World, world Speaker Series responsible for this event, which invites policymakers and strategists to speak at the Council and encourages frank, in-depth analysis. Today's discussion comes at an important moment for the legislative branch, uh, the debate over the National Defense Authorization Act is still underway. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the President is already considering a veto. Just last week, President Obama committed to maintaining current U.S. troop levels in Afghanistan. Uh, violence in Syria and Iraq and Eastern, uh, in Eastern Europe raise a specter of additional military challenges, potentially commitments overseas. Around the globe, the threat of terrorism persists. And though the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran garnered congressional support to move forward last month. Just a couple of weeks ago, the House passed legislation imposing additional restrictions on the lifting of sanctions. So it's a complex moment. Uh, uh, Representative Smith, you and your committee have no shortage of challenges to face. Uh, a native of Washington, uh, uh, Representative Smith took office in 1997 representing the 9th District after successful stints as a lawyer and a state senator. Now in his 10th term as congressman, he's the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. He formally chaired the subcommittee on air and land forces and terrorism and unconventional threats and capabilities subcommittee. He also sat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. 
Congressman Smith came out in support of the Iran deal on September 1st, saying in his statement, quote, it is hard to see how turning this deal down strengthens our position or furthers our national security interests in the region. Uh, our own Iran task force at the Atlantic Council, chaired by Stu Eisenstadt, came down very much in the same spot. He has also been outspoken and critical of the Benghazi Committee making the rounds of evening news programs in recent weeks to share his views. He wrote recently in an op-ed, there have been three remarkable, and this is a quote, three remarkable dem dem diplomatic milestones uh, of 2015. The 20-year anniversary of normalizing relations with Vietnam, the nuclear deal with Iran, and the reopening of the U.S. Embassy in Havana. All of which he says, quote, remind us that engagement is indis an, an indispensable tool in our arsenal. So uh, we're looking very much forward to hearing from you on these issues and more and assessing uh, America's strategic defense priorities. Uh, after that, Dan Chu, um, a, a huge experience at the Pentagon and elsewhere, one of the great experts on, on this in the strategic field are, uh, himself, Deputy Director of the Scowcroft Center, will take over the moderation because I am not competent to deal with these subjects, and he is. But at any rate, the floor is yours, Congressman. It's a delight to have you here. Thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that introduction, and I would only correct one thing. I wouldn't exactly call myself successful as a lawyer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> about my second year of law school, I determined that I didn't want to be a lawyer. That's why I ran for the state senate. Um, but uh, no, I think it is a very, very interesting time. And I just want to say a quick word about the NDAA and the, and the budget issue and what's coming up. And it's funny. It's been months and months and months, and even now that the bills, you know, on the president's desk, people are still saying, gosh, you know, it's the great debate. Will he veto it? Won't he veto it? Um, he has said from the very beginning that he will veto it, and it's going to be vetoed. Uh, people keep hoping, well, no, man, no. He has said it over and over and over and over again. The bill will be vetoed. Um, it'll be vetoed for the reasons uh, that Ash Carter outlined, I, I gather, in the Wall Street Journal this morning, um, and that is that its reliance on the OCO. Um, and an undependable source of funding again uh, to try and you know keep keep the Pentagon afloat. There is no question what we need to do uh, on the budget side. We need to get rid of the budget caps. Uh, and if we don't get rid of the budget caps, um, the Pentagon is going to be facing a level of uncertainty um, that is going to continue to make it very difficult to budget. And I think that's one, been one of the great challenges. And I'll get to the international challenges in a moment. But ever since 2011, um, when we were uh, in the month of March and our six-month CR was about to run out, um, and we weren't sure if the new uh, Republican House was going to you know, pass a budget, um, and, and move us forward, the Pentagon has faced a level of budgetary uncertainty unprecedented in the history of this country. We have gone from CR to CR to threat and shutdown to actual shutdown to threat and shutdown to a two-year agreement. Um, you know, and I vividly remember in, in March of that 2011 year, I had dinner with um, then Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, um, General Corelli, and you know, was talking to him about what they were trying to deal with with, and he said, look, we don't know what we can fund and what we can't fund. Every day we got lawyers telling us, okay, you can spend money on that. And then the next day, well, actually, no, we went back and looked at it, no, you can spend money on this, but not on that. You can take it out of this fund, but not out of that fund. That level of budgetary uncertainty is very harmful to the Pentagon. And if we accept the OCO approach uh, to funding, if we accept the Republican budget resolution that leaves those caps in place, um, and relies on this budget gimmick, um, we are still in that place. Uh, so the president is saying, look, we can't have an NDAA, we can't have an appropriations process that doesn't lift the budget caps. And this is all part of that larger negotiation that goes into that. Um, there's a lot of good in the National Defense Authorizing Act, but the budgetary uncertainty that it perpetuates outweighs that good. That's why I oppose the bill on the floor, why the president's going to veto it. And then hopefully we'll get some budgetary certainty and the good in that bill will be allowed to go forward along with a decent budget approach. Um, so that's what's happening on the budget side. I internationally, I think you know, we, we do in fact have a strategy. Um, it's just a strategy that's being put in place in a very difficult and challenging world. And there is an enormous amount of frustration. 
uh, in the US that we aren't simply able to sort of force our will on the bad actors of the world. Um, that we can't force Putin to be more reasonable, that we can't force Iran uh, to stop supporting terrorism, that we can't force places like Syria and Libya and Yemen you know, to have a stable government that does not breed terrorism. Uh, for that matter, uh, that, that we you know, can't force even purported allies like Saudi Arabia from allowing some of their citizens to continue to fund some of that very extremism. And I think when you, when you look at the Republican debates and when you look at their discussion of foreign policy, um, there is a, a very dangerous thread running through it. It is all frustration and no solution. It is all, well, I'd be tougher. You know, I wouldn't let these guys push us around. I'd go to China and I'd tell them to stop doing this. I'd go to Russia and I'd tell them this. And I think that way of looking at the world is incredibly naive to begin with, but also very dangerous. Um, because if you believe that those who disagree with you can ultimately be forced to agree, that is what pushes you into military action. Um, that is what pushes you into wars that we'd better off we'd be better off not being in. And you know, and when you think about the discussions that you've heard on the Republican side of what they've said about Syria, or what they said about Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq and Russia, I mean, you have to ask yourself the question: If we wind up with a Republican president, how many wars do they intend to start, and what do they intend to do with them exactly? What do they think the outcome is going to be? And one of the lessons, I think one of the biggest lessons that I hope we have learned from the last dozen years is that there is a limit on what US military might, as, as terrific as it is, uh, and we have you know, arguably the strongest military in the history of the world. As strong as it is, there is a limit on the outcomes it can force in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, we wanted a different outcome in Iraq. We still want a better outcome in Afghanistan. But we are not going to be able to send 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, 200,000 US troops to those places and impose our will upon them. So what do we do? We build partnerships. We use our military tactically and intelligently where it can achieve a result that is going to be positive for us. And we understand that if we are going to be successful in meeting the challenges, the two biggest things that are going to, going, to, going to drive that are our ability to build partnerships and our ability to negotiate and get to positive diplomatic solutions. And yes, there will also be a military component. But if we don't do those first two things, that military component is never going to get us there. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of this. One of the places where we've actually been, been reasonably successful in terms of containing a threat is in the Horn of Africa. Um, Somalia has long been one of those failed states uh, and a breeding ground for terrorism. But we have managed to contain al-Shabaab. We have managed to stop any international terrorist attacks uh, from coming out of there with a very limited US military presence. What we've done is we've partnered with Ethiopia. We've partnered with Kenya. We've partnered with Uganda and Burundi to lesser extents um, to build a coalition in that region to contain the threat but to contain the threat primarily driven by local actors. Um, that is what is going to be likely to be more successful. Um, we have also, I think, where we've succeed, succeeded militarily is using, um, through primarily special ops and intelligence, you know, targeting the networks that threaten us. And you know, the big question, you know, what, what are, what's the greatest threat to the United States? Um, well, there are many um, very strong threats right now, but I still contend uh, that the greatest threat is violent Islamist extremism. Um, and you know, this is ISIL and Al-Qaeda um, and Boko Haram and a whole bunch of other different groups that have essentially hijacked uh, a religion and forced forward a very violent nihilistic ideology. Yes, I, Russia is unquestionably a threat. China is a challenge. But the one group out there right now um, that would kill every single one of us if they could is ISIL, is Al-Qaeda, is these violent <laughs> extremist groups. They are the ones that I think pose the greatest threat. So how we contain that threat is enormously important. Um, and I think, you know, a 
General McChrystal said, you know, way back in the early part uh, of the 21st century there, um, was that it takes a network to beat a network. And I think we've done a decent job of building a network to counter the Al-Qaeda network, to counter um, the, the ISIL network, to stop the broader threat. But that's but a Band-Aid. You know, what do we do to stop the ideology? And that's where the diplomacy and the hard work of finding partners comes in. And that, I would say, of, of many discouraging aspects to the international environment right now, the most discouraging is the difficulty that we've found um, in finding those partners, in finding moderates um, in the Muslim world with the strength to stand up to these groups and contain them. You know, and, and Syria is, is the most depressing example of this. Thomas Friedman wrote a column at least a year ago, maybe a couple years ago now, talking about the Syrian um, revolution, which, which started originally um, as a somewhat democratic, secular approach. Um, basically, they wanted a greater voice in their government, um, and Assad was viewed as a, a ruthless dictator who wasn't giving them that. Well, he wasn't just viewed as that, he was that. Um, but then, you know, people started coming to Syria to fight. And as Friedman pointed out, of the tens of thousands of people who came to Syria to fight, they were all extremists. Where, where were the moderates? Where were the people who wanted a greater voice? Um, who wanted democracy, where were those folks um, you know, in the Muslim world that were going to come um, to Syria to fight? Nowhere. Um, it was taken over uh, by the violent extremists, um, as has happened in Libya and elsewhere. So we have got to work very, very hard to build partnerships uh, with allies wherever we can find them. And certainly there are examples of those allies. Um, Jordan, um, the Kurds, Turkey, there are other folks that we can work with, uh, but we have got to work with them to find a partnership because to defeat this ideology, it is not going to be the U.S. military showing up and saying, we're going to bring you down. It is going to have to be locally driven and we're going to have to work diplomatically uh, to get there to contain that threat um, as we go forward. And in the meantime, I think it is very, very important to contain that threat. Now, one of the other challenges that we face in the U.S. Um, is, you know, we always get the question from the reporters, are we winning? That's, that's sort of the American way of looking at things. It's, as I like to say, that's why we don't like soccer. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you mean, it, 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 there's a tie? But nobody scored? Um, it's America. We win. Um, that's not how this is going to work for a little while. We are going to have to be smart about containing the threat and making incremental progress in reducing that threat. You know, and as tempting as it is to say we could drop 100,000 U.S. troops into Syria and Iraq and wipe out ISIL tomorrow, um, maybe we could, uh, but there would be other extremist groups that would pop up in a heartbeat. We have got to build and work with moderate allies to get to a place where those extremist groups don't have the fertile ground that they have. And, you know, their, their greatest argument because um, certainly they are unable to govern in any sort of sensible way. Uh, but the strongest argument that they always make is we are the only ones that are willing to stand up and fight to defend um, Islam against Western aggression. So the more Western aggression there is, the more it feeds into their argument. You know, this has got to be driven by locals. That's why in Afghanistan, you know, you hear the criticism, we need more troops, we need more troops. No, we need an Afghan government that can stand up for itself. Now, it's a balance. You know, I support the president's decision not to take us all the way down to zero um, because those folks in Afghanistan still need some help and support. But if we give in to the idea that, well, we need more, that just, once again, drives home the message that the West is being you know, militarily aggressive in a Muslim country and also gives the Afghan a government an excuse to not get to where they need to be. And they have made progress as a fighting force. Um, and we have a much better president and President Ghani to work with, a, a somewhat reliable partner. Um, but again, it has got to be locally driven. We have got to find those local partners to do that. I think that is one of the biggest, biggest threats out there. As far as Russia is concerned, um, I think it's perfectly appropriately appropriate that we're, we're beefing up NATO forces in Western Europe, um, that we're trying to you know, do what we can to strengthen uh, energy independence in Western Europe. Um, and look, at the end of the day, Putin is pushing what is pushing, but 
his economy is in a shambles. And for right now, uh, with the nationalistic fervor about the Ukraine going on and all that, people aren't noticing that. Um, but Russia is weaker now than they were before, certainly from an economic standpoint. And I think patience is really, really important there as well. Patience, but also we do need to confront them uh, where appropriate. And I think the Ukraine is an appropriate place to do it. This is something that Chairman Thornberry and I agree on, um, that we should be providing lethal aid to the Ukrainians to put them in a better position to defend themselves, to basically drive up the cost of Russia's meddling in the Ukraine. Uh, but ultimately, we need to be very, very cautious. We do not want to step across the line and start a war with Russia. The consequences of that would be devastating for us and devastating for Western Europe. Um, push back, but push back tactically and intelligently, and again, build allies uh, where appropriate. Um, as far as China is concerned, I agree with the President's decision uh, that we should start uh, having a presence in what are international waters, uh, even if China is trying to claim they are not. Uh, but actually, where China is concerned, I think they have more invested uh, in a peaceful and prosperous world uh, than Russia, certainly uh, than ISIL and those violent extremist groups. Uh, China wants to succeed economically, and I think they are a potential partner in meeting some of these other challenges. Um, and we should find those opportunities to work with them where we can, uh, while continuing to work with our other allies in the Asian region uh, to make sure that China simply doesn't force its will upon them uh, to gobble up territory. But I think there is a balance to be struck there. And again, in terms of the order of threats, uh, the violent extremists are at the top of the list, and then Russia. And that's what we need to be prepared for. But to be prepared for this, you know, there are, again, and I'll close on this, two big things that we need to do. One, forgive me, we need a frickin' budget. Um, we need to stop the games. And I will say one of the most encouraging things that happened in the last five years, frankly, was the discharge peti petition on the Export-Import Bank. Um, now, forget how you feel, even if you hate the Export-Import Bank. I don't, I think it's a good idea, I think it's a good thing. But the fact that 41 Republicans were willing to sign a discharge petition was an absolute sea change. In 19 years in Congress, I can't recall a single member of the majority ever signing a discharge petition. So finally, we had Republicans in the majority who were willing to stand up to that 40 or 50 members of their caucus um, who simply want to tear everything down, um, who simply don't care, frankly, um, if the United States government suffers. In their view, the United States government is the enemy. Um, so the more that it can be cut, the more that it can be wounded, the better off we are. Um, I disagree with them on that strongly. I think the majority of the Republican caucus, caucus disagrees with them on that. They just haven't been willing to do anything about it for five years. Um, but in the defense environment, if we don't get rid of these budget caps and give some budget certainty, um, we are going to not have a strong enough defense to meet the challenges that we need. Um, not to mention what it's doing to us domestically. Uh, in terms of infrastructure and investment uh, in those critical parts that can help make us a prosperous enough country to continue to be successful. Um, that, too, I think is very, very important. So that's my basic outline of the challenges. Uh, I'll look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Do you want to sit or do you want to stay at the part? Do you want to sit or do you want to stay at the podium? for a second. So thanks very much, uh, Representative Smith. Let me say to you again how pleased I am uh, to have an opportunity to host you here at the uh, Atlantic Council. Uh, when I served in the strategy office uh, in the Pentagon, I was very privileged to have an opportunity to interact uh, with your staff, uh, both your own staff and the HASC staff uh, as well, and uh, had some of the most constructive discussions and engagements there, uh, and had the great privilege of uh, sitting at least across the room from you on a few occasions, uh, and really appreciating your interjections uh, as we tried to grapple with exactly what you were talking about uh, in uh, your discussion today, uh, trying really hard to deal with both the uncertainty externally that we see in the world and all the really rapid changes we're seeing, but now compounded uh, by the uncertainty we were facing internally with changing budget assumptions, uh, not just on a year-to-year -year basis, but as you correctly pointed out, sometimes on month-to-month -month basis based on uh, how we were funded at a particular time. So thank you so much for 
uh, joining us here. And thank you so much for the way you presented uh, your discussion. I saw your piece in the Hill over the weekend uh, on those three major engagement uh, milestones that uh, Fred mentioned in his introduction. I thought it was a great piece and I had a bunch of questions about how that fit into your vision of kind of strategy for the US. And you did that really well here in, in this uh, discussion. Uh, but I want to pull a few threads if, if that's all right with you. No, no, it's not all right. Okay, we'll just stop it <laughs> and we'll go to the questions from the audience. I, I don't take challenging questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm hoping I'm inferring correctly from your, uh, your discussion here and from your piece. In particular on the piece, the part where you talked about, and we face that a lot as, as I do this thing we call the strategy initiative here. We face the criticisms that you raised at the beginning of your, your talk uh, frequently. First, we get the n number one criticism is the one that there is no strategy. Uh, and kind of a repetitive strain of there is no strategy, there is no strategy. Uh, and then to the extent there is a strategy, it must be a bad strategy because a better strategy, we would be stronger, tougher, uh, as you said, really uh, impose our will uh, on others. So when the engagement piece comes up very frequently as an important part of our strategy, the criticism is obviously that's weakness and not strength. I think you did a great job talking about how actually you need both, but particularly in an election year, uh, presidential election year, how do we stay away from the there is no strategy, a better strategy would be tough for simplicity, and really create more of a substantive discussion uh, about this as you did here today? Well, I, I think it's difficult, and I think it's, it's well, it's human nature, basically, um, you know, to be frustrated by things not going the way you want them to go, and certainly to be frustrated by people, or in this case, countries um, that you don't like that are doing bad things. <laughs> and to want to lash out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you always, you know, if you're going to really advance your interests, you need to be intelligent about, well, what's really in my best interest? And I think ultimately, it's difficult. Um, because I think the American public does look around the world and see the chaos um, that is developing and feel a very strong sense that we ought to be able to fix this. But I think to get them back to a, OK, what's a more intelligent approach here? Um, what's a better approach? You simply have to ask the question, how many wars do you want to fight? Mm. Um, and I know this is sort of rejected. Oh, no, no, we're not talking about going to war. But it's a fascinating thing. Actually, it was well over a year ago now. I was on Crossfire with Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum, you know, talking about it. And they kept saying, well, Obama's, you know, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. So that, I was like, what would you do? Well, I think we need to be tougher. No, 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 no. What would you do? OK, and if it's send 30,000 troops into Syria and Iraq, then that's a huge mistake. Um, and the American public, you know, it's, it's not that long ago that they were enormously frustrated um, by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that they, did, they, they felt very strongly that we had, you know, they wanted to come home, you know, stop this. Now, so you have to sort of drive home the point that, look, we're facing choices here. And I realize that the Donald Trump approach to facing choices is to ignore that and say, no, I would simply get what I want. Well, how? <laughs> because I'm me. <laughs> I would simply get what I want. I'd go and tell them, and they'd give it to me. Um, but that's not the way the world works. Right. And if that's not the way the world works, well, then you've got to make a choice. Um, how do you push uh, for what, what you really want in, in, a, in a strategic and intelligent way? And I think that's why having allies is so important. That's why diplomacy is important. Um, you know, we have our differences with Vietnam, and I have a very strong, one of the problems um, with my, my job in the national security world is I represent what is, I think, the most diverse district in America. Um, and by that I don't mean, it, it, there's many districts that have larger Hispanic populations or larger African American populations. I don't think there is a country in the world or even a piece of a country in the world that I don't have a constituency from. Um, <laughs> you know, in the Kent School District, they speak 145 different languages. Um, so we've got it all. And I've got a strong Vietnamese mm -hmm. population. Uh, I'm sorry, I went a long way away from the boat to come back to the point there. Um, and you know the Vietnamese government is far from perfect. Um, you know they are you know very restrictive, very dictatorial, not exactly where we would like them to be. Uh, on the other hand, um, they're a country that we can work with. Um, now we want to keep pushing them on the human rights record and on a bunch of other things. Um, but if we can negotiate that, if they can become an ally as we try to strategically position ourselves in terms of what China is doing, for example. 
well, there, there's an ally that we can work with. Or we could step back and say, well, we don't like what you're doing, so we're going to push you away. Um, that's what I mean by engagement strengthening our hand. And that, that a strategy of engagement, a strategy of you know, having a coalition behind you um, is not weakness, it's intelligence. I mean, you know, bar fight analogy is perhaps not good, um, <laughs> but if you were going into a bar fight, wouldn't you rather have more people on your side than against you? Um, and wouldn't it be smart to figure out how to do that? And that's all it is, is trying to build relationships and build allies so that we have more, more friends, more people to support us in what we're trying to accomplish. Right, makes a lot of sense. And as you pointed out, I mean, with that example in the China case, but also with Russia as well, really building up our alliances uh, to manage that situation in a context of strategic patience, as I think uh, you put it. But I think you also pointed out how difficult that's been in the case of ISIS-ISIL, uh, finding yeah. those partners uh, on the ground. Given where we are now, I mean, we went in, I think, essentially with that strategy. I think that's what the president talked about going in and that the military was going to support that effort to build up local partnerships. We've seen a lot of military. We haven't seen a lot of local partnerships in part because of uh, what you pointed out, the difficulty in finding the right yeah. uh, partners. Where does this kind of balance between engagement and, and, and military strength uh, go in a situation like this? I mean, right, right now, you know, we're, we're in a bad place because of the facts on the ground. Um, and there's a bunch of different second guessing that can go on. But again, I, I would emphasize that I think the real problem, you know, exists, you know, frankly, with, with our Arab allies. Um, and if we wish to build up more moderates to resist groups like ISIL, we need more help uh, from places like Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE. Uh, in the early days of the struggle in Syria, um, those Gulf countries had one focus. They hated Assad um, with a purple passion, um, in large part because of his alliance um, with Iran um, and the fact that they you know, view the world much more as Sunni Shia uh, than extremist moderate. Um, so they funded you know, a lot of the groups that wound up becoming the extremist groups that wound up going over uh, to ISIL. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, working with our Arab allies to try to convince them that being supportive of groups like this is not in their long-term best interest is, is critical. But it's, it, it's difficult. And I'm not going to stand here and say um, that, oh, if we just did this, this, and this, everything would be fine. I think in the meantime, we are going to have to employ our military as we are to contain ISIL um, and make sure that they don't spread. But they won't be defeated until the Sunnis in that region decide that that is not what they want um, and they have enough strength and enough support to defeat it. So as I take it from the way you've been describing things, and I think it makes a lot of sense, military is a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, for success. And you really envision the military as essentially providing the, the core security element, uh, essentially creating context for the engagement for the partnerships and the local uh, engagement to work more effectively. I think that makes a lot of sense, but my experience in the Pentagon, I suspect when you're on Hask, uh, sorry, as, as you are on Hask, uh, have this discussion with the Pentagon as well, um, is often that gets translated into how can the military do that engagement? Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. How do we parse those? Uh, there's clearly some overlap in the middle, but how do we parse that so it doesn't entirely become a military mission? Or should well, it? Well, I, I think. You know, this is the budget problem. This gets us back to right. um, you know what I mentioned at the very end of my remarks was that this isn't just about the military. Um, if you are cutting government, cutting government, cutting government, you are damaging all aspects of our national security strategy, and one of them is the State Department and diplomacy. Um, and you know, at the same time. I don't want to be the one to bring up Benghazi. Um, but you know, when you're cutting back on security budgets, when you're cutting back on the State Department budget, and then you're saying, how come you don't have enough out there? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that would be the reason that you don't have enough out there. Um, because we've, we've denigrated diplomacy um, to too large a degree. So yeah, I think we, we need to better, better fund the State Department. Something Bob Gates said this a long time ago. 
Um, and also, I think, on development strategy. I've done a lot of work on global development policy. USAID is doing the best they can. Um, well, at this point, I think they are doing the best they can because I think Raj Shaw did a fabulous job. I think Gail Smith's doing a fabulous job. Um, but look, we have, we have a horrific development structure in this, in this country. Um, we don't have a Department of Development. We have USAID, which is a tiny little piece. Um, everyone thinks that USAID is in charge of global development policy, but how can you be in charge of global development policy if you only have somewhere in the neighborhood of 14% of the budget? Um, because we've got 37 other agencies that are engaged. We've got the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we've got PEPFAR, Department of Defense does a whole bunch of development. It's all sort of puked all over the place in the government, and there's no, sorry, uh, there's no, <laughs> Wasn't the point I was gonna say, right, there's no, you know, there's no coordination there, and I think we need to better coordinate that development policy, because mm -hmm. development policy, as, as, as any special ops guy will tell you, uh, can be a key part of succeeding in building allies and friends. I remember right. talking with someone gosh, years ago, a retired special ops guy who was doing some work in North Africa back in the early 80s, and he said his greatest asset was the fact that he had a dentist, um, you know, because he could provide a service to the local people that they wanted. Um, in you know, another place where we've done some successful partnership building is in the southern Philippines. Um, I was over there five, six years ago, and um, our special ops guys are down there, and they worked very closely. First of all, they worked with the military in the Philippines to teach them what counterinsurgency looks like. And it's not kicking in the door and shooting first and asking questions later. Um, it's building partnerships, again, with the local people. And then it's fighting for the local population. Um, so our development and our diplomacy pieces, I think, are underfunded and on the development side, I think poorly organized so that we're not getting as much out of the money that we are spending as we should. Right, so that you, you hit on a number of, of great points there, both in terms of making sure to differentiate between who's doing engagement, but recognizing that there is some overlap. I mean, we used to uh, talk a lot about that in the 90s in terms of what we can do with some of that engagement that's below the kicking in the door uh, level. Yeah. And we seem to have lost that, particularly as uh, engagement and counterinsurgency became more about Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. uh, over time. But you also made it clear it's not a simple bifurcation, right? It's not yeah. the development agencies, many as they may be, doing development and DOD doing different things. It's about it's how they together. integrate that together. Yeah. And just if I, two quick things about yeah. that. First of all, counterinsurgency got a very, very bad name because of Iraq and Afghanistan. Counterinsurgency doesn't necessarily, you know, mean, I mean, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the notion of counterinsurgency was we were going to come in and we were going to essentially build governments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we were going to, you know, and I think we were way too ambitious um, in both places in terms of how we were going to come in and sort of impose a westernized view of the rule of law and all these other things. We basically were going to try to eat the entire elephant in one bite. Um, you know, and, and so people came to think of that as counterinsurgency. Um, counterinsurgency is really much more small bore. Um, it's much more providing a little bit of help so that the local population can do the bulk of the work and take it in whatever direction actually works in that part of the world. And that's the Philippines that I mentioned um, and some other places that we've worked in Africa. You know, it's not this wholesale, you know, we're going to, you know, build this entire new country. Um, because it's not, it's just not the Marshall Plan. It's not Japan, okay? Um, you know, it's, it, these are entirely different cultures in an entirely different place. Um, and if you do counterinsurgency intelligently, it is locally driven, not top down. And we went top down in a big way in Iraq and Afghanistan and just, you know, gave counterinsurgency a bad name when I still think it's an important component part. But the second piece of that is the military partnering effectively with these other agencies. Mm -hmm. Remember, I was in Kenya and I had a fascinating dinner. I had a couple of Navy SEALs who were um, uh, the liaisons who were taking us on this trip. And we had dinner with this uh, State Department uh, woman that I'd met in a couple other places. And, you know, listening to the three of them talk, you know, it was just like, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, the, 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 the SEALs like, well, look, you know, we know what we're doing, you know, all the State Department people, you know, they don't understand, you know, I can't provide security and everything. And then, State Department person told the story of how the military, without consulting uh, the local State Department people, decided there was a water problem up north of Kenya, so they sent the military in to drill all 
all these wells for them. And then the local population started spreading a rumor that the wells were poisoned. That's why the military was doing it. Let's just say everything went to hell at that point. Um, and I think both sides were kind of right. Um, they got to work together. And I think they've been effective. Again, back to the Philippines. You know, I was, there was this very relatively small, still is, um, special ops presence there. But they were in very good coordination mm -hmm. with the local USAID mm -hmm. person. Yeah, I went absolutely. over for when they, you know, they built a school. Um, and we went over for the ribbon cutting. And, right. you know, and you had the USAID person. You had the um, ambassador. And you had the local um, uh, special ops commander. And they all worked well together. It's got to be that integration. Um, and where you do that integration successfully um, and then integrate with the local population is where you have the best, the best chances right. of succeeding. Right, clearly more challenging if we try to focus more locally rather than that top-down approach exactly. you, were, you were talking about. Are there things Congress can do to help on that? I mean, one of the challenges I saw from the executive branch side is because there were different authorities and reporting chains, it was very difficult even when people met and tried to have that conversation to maintain the, um, the proper focus because the metrics were very different when uh, those folks went over to the Hill and reported to different uh, committees and so forth. Is sure. there a way to create that discussion on the Hill so that those two can converge in some way? Yeah, there's three things um, that we could do. Um, number one, not to sound like a broken record, but uh, we could pass a frickin' budget. budget. Um, <laughs> we could actually give all of those agencies a dependable source of funding. Right. Um, and I went down that road already, so I'll leave that one be. Um, second is what I said earlier, our development policy is not good. Um, it is not well organized. It is too spread out. Um, we really need to give clear chain of authority. I, like I said, I think we should have a Department of Development. I think we should follow the, the British model of the Department for International Development, and that's a long story. But um, where you actually do have a Department of Development that is focused, has control of the money, and then they are a true partner. Um, because that's, again, the, the main thing with the defense thing is um, you know, when they're working with development diplomacy, it's like, who's got the money? Mm -hmm. DOD's got the money. That's right. So, you know, it's like, you know, okay, you guys are cute. Uh, you don't have anything. Um, we got all the marbles here, so we're going to go do what we want to do. Um, I remember there was, I was in Burkina Faso, and, uh, you know, they were trying to encourage, you know, microfinance and everything. We went out to this business where they were making hats. Still have that hat, as a matter of fact. Um, and it was run by the Department of Defense. What is the Department of Defense doing making hats in Burkina Faso? Um, and the answer to that question is they had the money. Um, so the second thing is to empower the Department of Development. And the third thing, which is a little bit more difficult, um, but you know, when we did the Goldwater Nichols, when we did the, I forget which of the piece was, but we're integration, mm -hmm. where basically we were going to have the services start working mm -hmm. better together. What you happen is if you're in the Army, well, you, got, you get a one-year task to sure. an Air Force assignment. And that's how you learn to work with the Air Force. Well, you could do the same thing uh, between development, diplomacy, um, and defense. Um, you could have as part of your career path, you know, if you're a diplomat, you spend a year working with an Army unit on something. You have the military task over there. You have them task and work together. Now, the reason this is difficult um, is because uh, the development folks and the diplomacy folks they just don't have the resources. If you come to them and say, hey, we're going to take five of your people for a year, they're like, I already have you know, 15 fewer than I need. You take five for a year, what the hell am I going to do? Um, so it, it comes down to funding. But if you could have that type of job sharing, if you will, you get that integration and you build the relationships and you, right. you, you begin to understand each other better and develop a respect um, for the various jobs and you work better together. Right. Uh, the, so those are, are great points, and as a kind of old school strategy guy uh, who looks at ends, ways, means, I just really appreciate the way you've gone through all of that as you think about this, kind of the objectives, the ways uh, of balancing engagement and, and military strength, and the means, everything from kind of the structural implementation to the budgetary requirements. I, I think that's a discussion that is unfortunately that kind of full up discussion of how we approach the world is, is missing these days. And before we go to the audience, I'm going to ask you a question on the budget the same way I asked you on the, on the strategy. Again, during a, a big election year, 
how do we get people to focus on the need for kind of a, a more strategic approach uh, to budgeting? You know, in the news every year, the end of the fiscal year comes up like it's a surprise party uh, in some way, and everybody's kind of scrambling to, to try and meet it, and the public doesn't seem uh, to, to bat an eye at that. How can we get that, uh, so that get the discussion so that the public is holding all of us more accountable uh, for doing that in a more structured way? <sighs> Well, the public is a huge part of the problem, um, which is what is rarely acknowledged. And I saw someone actually audibly gasp in the audience. Um, <laughs> he's a politician. He's blaming the public. Um, so let me clarify. I'm not actually blaming the public. I'm just saying that they have a role to play. I would say right. the reason that the public has gotten into such a bad place uh, is two things, um, polling and political promises. Um, it is truly, truly frightening to me the degree to which, um, through data analysis, we can figure out exactly what every single one of you wants um, and then pander to it. Um, and you know, one of the things that I learned early on in my career, if you look back through my campaigns, the number of things that I have actually promised, pretty close to zero. This drives my consultants crazy, by the way. Um, but you know, I promise I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna understand the district, I'm gonna listen to you, and then here's my broad philosophy. However, most people have done polling and figured out that the American public wants three things. Um, they want a balanced budget, they want to be fiscally responsible, um, they want spending programs that benefit them, and they want their taxes cut. Um, now, as I always joke, I don't know why you pay a consultant $50,000 to tell you that. I'd tell you that for free. Um, I could just walk down the street or any common sense, I guess any sentient being would know that people want something for nothing. Um, you don't need a pollster to tell you that. Um, but that's what we've figured out. So when you go in, and everyone always talks about how the big problem is we have too many safe districts. Swing districts are actually worse, and I know this because I've represented both. And the reason swing districts are worse is because what you wind up electing is someone who has promised as much as is humanly possible because they have to do that. Because when you're in a race and it's down to 1%, 2% here and there, you don't have the luxury of being honest with people. Um, you know, you, they want to know that you're not going to cut Social Security, you're not going to cut Medicare, you're not going to raise their taxes, you're going to balance the budget. And so you promise that, you know, and I've sat down with these candidates and it's, it's, it's all I can do to not break out laughing as they go through their, as they go through their talking points. Um, well, you know, I think fiscal responsibility is enormously important. You know, families balance their budget, not true by the way, but anyway, um, you know, family, and I think it's really important, so, okay, all right. So, you know, what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to cut? You know, I mean, entitlement's a big part of it. Well, you know, entitlements are really important. I don't think we should be cutting back on Social Security and Medicare. I think we should reform the system to make it better for everybody. You know, so, okay. Um, taxes, you know, what taxes do you want to raise? Well, we need tax reform that creates a fairer, uh, Jesus. You know, it's just <laughs> like, okay, so what you've just done is you've promised uh, $5 for one. And then the American public comes to expect it, and you don't deliver it because, well, no one gives you a magic wand when you get elected to this job, so you can't possibly deliver it. And then the frustration grows and grows and grows, um, and the public just looks up and says, you're all a bunch of idiots, um, and walks away from it and you know, doesn't hold people accountable. I think mm -hmm. there's another little nefarious piece to this, and that is that you have the Grover Norquist wing of the party, which is, um, if not ascendant, at least in control at the moment, the I don't want to kill government, I just want to shrink it down to a sufficient size where I can drown it in my bathtub way of looking at the world. That's an actual quote for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, and you know, so basically, whatever makes government look bad is good, you know? Um, and that feeds into this cynicism. And, and that's where we've become trapped. I mean, we need to really talk to the American public about, you know, here's the choice in the budget. If we were to balance the budget any time in the next five or 10 years, it would have a devastating economic impact on this country. Devastating. Now, if we were to bring, as we have been doing, by the way, bring that deficit down, reasonable, we can't be in debt forever, um, bring that deficit down in a reasonable way, then that moves us in a positive direction. But to do that, we're going to have to cut actual programs. That's the great thing. If you ask the American public, 
do you want to cut the government by 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 2%, 12%? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. OK, um, here's the budget. Um, so do you want to cut this? No, 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 this, this, this. Literally, Pew does a great poll on this. Every single area where the federal government spends money, they don't want to cut. But they want to cut the government by 10%. So where do you, you know, and, and that mm -hmm. is the problem. Right. You know, we got to be more honest about it. And I'm not saying we can't be more efficient, we can't be more effective, you, can't find, you know, but you're not going to find $18 trillion in efficiencies. You're just not. Um, so we got to get some sort of honest conversation about that so that the public can, you know, support it in a more intelligent way. Sorry, that was a longer answer than I wanted to give, but it's a really big point because that is ultimately what has got us tied in the budgetary knot so, that we are tied in. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I appreciate you, you being very frank about this at the end, but this is really a critical element. When we think about, you know, we started this discussion talking about strategy and engagement and, and the world, and when we think about that, ought, too often this part of the discussion is omitted, and we don't talk about how actually, if we want to change those things, the things we need yeah, to do We need ourselves. to be a more effective government. I'm right. sorry, that was too long. Right. Right. Let's, <laughs> Let's throw it open to, uh, to the audience. Uh, we have some folks with microphones as well. I'd ask, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just identifying yourself as, as you ask your uh, question. We'll try and get as many in uh, as we can. We'll start over here. Hi, Paul Gephardt. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, comments. They were fantastic. And if I could just know, as you said, you know, strategy without the means, you know, a nice theory. But you were just getting into some of the means at the end. If I could push you just one step further in terms of the, how the sausage will get made on the FY16 budget. We've got a CR now. Do we have a, you know, is the way forward another sort of Murray Ryan to your deal? Um, you, you brought up an you know, interesting... Uh, the discharge petition on Exim, um, you know, is there an opportunity for uh, folks to step forward and use that approach as well? Yeah, a uh, straightforward answer. Either the budget caps get lifted or we have a period of government shutdown and then a CR. Um, and the only way the budget caps get lifted is if some number of Republicans in the caucus are willing to cross over, um, cut that deal, and do it with a majority of Democratic votes. That's it. Those are the two choices. Does the export-import, I was talking with one of those moderates this morning, um, who seemed to be of the opinion that they would be able to get that deal. We'll see. Um, I wish I could be more optimistic. Um, but they got to be willing to put it on the floor. And by the way, I wasn't exactly breaking out the party hats about the Murray Ryan deal. Um, because what the Murray Ryan deal did, it was good. I mean, it was better than where we were at. And I tip my hat to both of them for being able to get something done. Um, it gave us two years of budget certainty is too strong a word, of greater, greater budget certainty. But basically what it did is it took 10-year money and it spent it in two years. All right? And you can only do that for so long um, before you get into trouble. Um, so we need something a little bit better than that um, to get us to something. And we need more than two years. But the only way it happens is if those moderates do what they did on XM. Let's go over to the other side of the room, please. I'm Mr. Uh, Smith. This is Peter Husey at the Air Force Association. Um, in the Senate, in looking at all the appropriations bills, they've been filibustered every single time uh, was a motion was offered to bring them up on the floor of the Senate. Yeah. And Donnelly and Manchin, the two Democrats, have voted in favor of cloture to get them brought up, the defense bill right. brought up. So. As you know, both leaders in the House and Senate have said, let's go regular order. That's my first question. Second question is, GAO says there are $125 billion in tax fraud in the earned income tax credit and the um, child tax credit, plus food stamps, yearly. And it's not just people who are cheating. It's people who are actually filing returns who never earned any money in America, particularly Russians and Chinese folks who are just sending in thousands and thousands of returns, and it's only after the fact we find out. I think you could cut money out of the budget, and maybe you have to say, no we're question. not going to fund X, Y, Z, but if you're not going to balance the budget, which Ryan said last night he wanted to offer a 10-year deal to balance it, would you be willing to add to the debt deal a, a bill that cuts the projected deficit, let's say, in half? Oh, yeah. That's what I said. 
that you got to get you got to bring, bring it down slowly. Um, but but I'll caution you on on one thing. Um, and first of all, interesting that you talk about food stamps and other things. There's also a whole lot of people you know on the rich end of the scale who are cheating on their taxes um, repeatedly to a number that is at least that high. Um, while meanwhile we cut the IRS's enforcement ability because collecting taxes is a bad thing. Uh, so if you want to stop this type of fraud, one of the things you're going to need to do is you're going to need to empower the IRS to actually go out and, and get it. Um, but the second thing I will tell you, it is possible that we will be the first society in the history of the human race um, that eliminates um, that sort of cheating. Uh, but I doubt it. Um, we, we can. We can, okay, that's good. We can do it. Cut, cut it in half. But the thing is, the thing that, that really always makes me nervous about this type of discussion is, is, is it gives people a pass on what I said earlier about the fact that if you want a balanced budget, you are going to have to raise real taxes and cut real programs. You know, there, you can't just get at it from waste, fraud, and abuse. But yes, that would be great. That'd be wonderful. I'd be happy to do that, happy to look at whatever reforms we could do to save that. And I'd be happy to put us on a path towards a, towards a balanced budget in 10 years. Um, you know, I think that, that's, that's probably reasonable. Um, but what, you're going to have to raise taxes as part of that. And if we can do it through you know, eliminating some of the fraud and getting it that way, you know, that's helpful. Um, but it's not, not going to get us there. Um, as far as the Senate is concerned, um, you know, look, that's one of the things that makes government so difficult to function um, is the way the Founding Fathers set it up. Um, I've got the standing joke now where I say the Founding Fathers, those bastards. Um, you know, here's the way they set up the government. Oh, the Founding Fathers, they set up this beautiful government. It's the best thing in the world. It's the best thing ever in all of history. Yeah, but it created a situation where a very small group of people can hold the entire country hostage um, because you know, you run for election, you win. Okay, you win the presidency, but you didn't win the House, and you only won 56 seats in the Senate, so you can't do anything in the Senate. I am enjoying the fact, by the way, that all these Republicans that spent the last several years when the Democrats were quote unquote in control of the Senate, um, you know, but oh, how come you guys can't get anything done? You're in charge of the Senate. You're not getting anything done. Well, now the Republicans are quote in charge of the Senate unquote, and they can't get anything done either. Gee, I wonder why. What, oh, is there some mystery there? Well, it's the 60 vote thing, you idiots, which we all know about. If you don't have 60 votes, you don't actually run the Senate. Um, and then you gotta sort of get along with each other. Um, so, you know, look, it's something that somebody pointed out to me that after World War II, the US went in and reconstructed several different governments. I forget, Italy, Germany, Japan. In no case did they reconstruct it based on our model. <laughs> Um, I don't think that was an accident. Um, so, you know, our, our model is very, very difficult unless everybody's getting along. You know, if we've got the post-World War II consensus, it's all good. Um, but if you have any sort of deep divisions, then you wind up paralyzed. You know, in Great Britain, you run and you win. And if you win, you get to govern. Um, until people decide that you're not governing properly and then they throw you out. Or Canada would perhaps be a better example this week. Um, you know, but at least you get to govern. Here, you win. And again, this is very confusing for the American public. You're in charge of the Senate. You're not getting anything done. How, President Obama, how come, he, how come he can't shut down Guantanamo? How come he can't pass gun? He said he was going to do it. All he has to do is get John Boehner and the Tea Party to agree with it. <laughs> they leave out that part. So yeah, this whole checks and balances, you can't do anything unless everybody agrees thing makes it very, very difficult to solve some of these problems. So I apologize to the audience. We have run out of our uh, allotted time. I'm sorry, I, can I I'll take, probably take just one more question? Of course. Have you been? Please. Thank you. Sorry, tell me on. Sure, thank you. George Nicholson, uh, Special Operations Global Foundation. Uh, one of the things you mentioned before is the president is probably going to go ahead and veto the NDAA. Yes. With your crystal ball, is that veto going to be sustained within the House? I mean, within the when the Senate and it comes back. And the other thing, yesterday, Congressman Thornberry and Senator McCain over at Brookings said one of the problems we've got out there starting in January, they're going to take a hard look. Do we need to redo Goldwater Nichols? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think we do. I think. I think. You know, I'll start with the very, very positive part of this. We had a great big four process um, with Reed, McCain, Thornberry, and me. 
we worked very, very well together and acquisition reform and reform of the Pentagon, I think you've got the right constellation of people uh, in place to really make significant difference. Speaking of waste, um, speaking of places where we could save money and not spend $8 billion on the expeditionary fighting vehicle and have it not work and Lord knows how much money on the F-35 and $2 billion over on an aircraft carrier and on and on and on. Um, I think you've got people who are really committed to making changes there um, that would make, make a huge difference. Um, so without, without question, I think that that can happen. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? In other words, you said the, uh, the president is going to go ahead and veto. veto. Is, there, is there is going to be the support? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 well, it's, and this isn't me being a genius or anything. There were 146 Democratic no votes on the NDAA in the House. It's sustained. Those 146 people aren't going to change their mind. There were 11 Republican no votes. Eh, they might be a little bit on the squishier side uh, in terms of sustaining a Republican veto, but there were 146 Democratic no votes. Um, let's just hope nobody gets sick. Um, but uh, there were also some Democrats not voting at that time. So the veto will be sustained. And then it'll be, you know, be part of the larger budget discussion, you know, whether or not we get an NDAA. Thank you very much. Representative Smith, let me say thank you so much uh, for such a frank and insightful discussion with us here today. You really epitomize what we are trying to do here in terms of making the discussion more substantive, more constructive, more comprehensive. You did all of that here today. Thank you. Really enjoyed thank this you. discussion. Please join me in thanking Representative Smith. Thanks. 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 Thanks.